Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word, how precious it is. During the book of Exodus, many people call it the going out. I call it the coming home. It is entering the promised land, and it's happened. All these things happen as an example whereby we know what befalls us in the end, entering that promised land, entering the return of Christ and what happens just prior to that. So it makes very interesting reading. What, what has happened here? In the last lecture, we went through the tabernacle, what each item, piece of furniture, and everything stood for, and ended it with Christ ripping the Holy of Holies, the veil, from top to bottom, whereby now you can all go in and what was the tabernacle for? A place to commune with God. So today, you can still do the same thing. You don't need a priest. You don't need a preacher. All you have to do is talk to him. Go through those things that symbolizes your approach to Almighty God. It has been ripped open by Jesus Christ, and under his blood, if you're a believer, you can commune with our Heavenly Father. So anyway, while Moses was up in Mount Sinai, the bush of God, the, he was up there 40 days and 40 nights. The children went bananas. That's just putting it mildly compared to what it was. They built, had old Aaron build him a golden calf. He was the head priest, Levitical priest, head of it. <clears throat> and he fashioned it. And they were having quite a party, and it really ticked our father off. He said to Moses, I'm going to kill the whole bunch and I'm going to take you and establish um, the nation. And Moses, being the man he was, and Father, please, the Egyptians will say, you brought him out here just to destroy him. Give him another opportunity. He, he stood, there he had an opportunity to be the king of kings. Not, not the king of kings, but really important. But he didn't think of himself. That's what a leader does. He thought of his people. <clears throat> but he comes down, and then Moses gets ticked. He threw the tablets, um, the tables, that is to say, with the Ten Commandments on it, broke them, and very upset, he's going to clean house. He's going to straighten this out here where they, they're partying. When God has opened the Red Sea, has destroyed Pharaoh's army, has fed the manna from heaven and quail on a, a plenty, and they would do this. They would turn their back on God. They're going to pay for it. So let's pick it up, if we may, where Moses confronts Aaron in chapter 32. We'll pick it up with verse 23 as Moses questions Aaron. Verse 23, for, and Aaron's making excuses. Listen to what he says. Aaron speaks. For they said unto me, make us gods, which shall go before us. For... As for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we would not what has become of him. We don't know what's happened to him, 40 days and 40 nights. Always remember, God only works little by little by little. He doesn't just boom, make everything happen at once. Little by little by little, you've got to have patience. Moses had that patience. The people didn't. Verse 24, And I said unto them, O and making excuses, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave to it to me. Then I cast it into the fire, and there came out this calf. He, he's lying. Do you remember what really happened? You'll read it back in verse 4 of this same chapter. Let, let me read it to you. You're not going to have it. This, this is what Aaron did when he received the gold. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it. He did what? He fashioned it with a graving tool. After he had made it a molden calf, 
And they said, These be thy gods, and uh, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. What a lie. What an insult to the living God. Aaron, here he's saying, I just put it in there and it just came out that way. He made it. He tooled it. He formed it. <clears throat> now, next verse, 25. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. This doesn't mean naked like you think of naked. They've got enemy all around them. There's no guard. There's nobody standing guard, nobody watching. They're easy prey while they're partying out here with the enemy all around them. Somebody's let the guard all the way down. And as far as protection is concerned, they are naked. Uh, anyone could have taken them over. Verse 26. Then Moses stood in the gap of the camp, the gate, rather, of the camp, and he said, Who is on the Lord's side? Question. He's going to, we're going to clean camp. Let him come unto me, and all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him, at least the Levitical priesthood. 27, and he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from the gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his, his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. That is to say that wants to keep partying and worshiping this idol God. Kill him, destroy him. Now, what does that relate to today? False Christ is coming. And to worship him is not of death by the sword. Unless you want to call Satan's tongue a sword that comes out of his mouth. It is a spiritual death. They are dead spiritually when you worship the false messiah. And unfortunately, there are very few people that are taught the false messiah comes first. They're not equipped for it. They're left naked to defend themselves against the coming of the Antichrist because they feel and have been told that they're going to flitter away. They don't have anything to worry about. But there's just one problem. It's not biblical. They're not warned. They, are, they have no guard whatsoever or preparation to fulfill that that is written in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21 to stand against the false one. And what happens to those that worship? Spiritually, they're deader than a hammer. Verse 28, And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. They, they didn't want to give it up. They enjoyed the partying. Doesn't cut it, friend, 29. For Moses had said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord. Even every man upon his son and upon his brother that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. And, and, and this is the way it is. Do you want God's blessings? So many people wonder, well, wonder why God doesn't bless me. Well, it's real simple. If, if you're not in the Word, if you don't understand the Word being taught chapter by chapter and verse by verse, if you're in the way of the world and outside the way of God, you're in a heap of hurt. Um, do you think God should bless those that were worshiping that calf? Then let me ask it a little different way. Do you think God should bless those that think they're going to fly away here and never make a stand for God? As he requests in Mark uh, in Mark chapter 13, that he wants you without premeditation to stand up to the false Messiah and allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you? How, how many people know that today? How many people are equipped? And one that will not do that or is even ignorant concerning that fact, do you think God's going to bless them? When he sent them a letter, this letter, 
explaining everything in detail. And they haven't read it. Do you think for a moment God's going to bless them? The answer is no. Why? They do not deserve it. God is always totally, completely fair. And when he sends you a letter telling you how to receive his blessings and you don't obey that, why do you deserve a blessing? You don't. It is so simple to love a father, as he stated in a lecture hence, that when you love him, your enemies are his enemies. Your adversaries are his adversaries. He's with you when you're with him. So it's very important that you be pleasing to your father. Verse 30, And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin. And now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. Maybe, maybe I can make an atonement for it. You understand? He's going to offer himself for their sin. There again, you see the type of Messiah, for Christ did offer himself, did, uh, was an offering for us that our sins are forgiven. Atonement. Verse 31, And Moses returned unto the Lord, and he said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin, and have made them gods of gold. You, and God knew it. He's the one that that tipped him off. Verse 32, Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. In other words, take me, and, and, and let me be that sacrifice. Uh, and quite frankly, if they didn't change and didn't have an opportunity, he didn't want to be around them anyway. Uh, again, this lets you know serving your father and understanding his letter is a very important thing. Many of you have a destiny and a purpose. And um, you're not playing games and you're not playing church. You're real in your love for Almighty God and wanting to be pleasing to him. Verse 33, And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. God is always fair. Not Moses. Not When you're pleasing God, he doesn't want to blot you out. He loves you. Verse 34. Therefore, now go. Lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, Mine angel shall go before thee. That is to say, the very angel of the Lord will clear the way. I'll make it possible. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. Uh, they're going to pay for it. There'll, there'll be one way or the other. Boy, there better be some repenting. That's, that's what cleans the slate and gives you a fresh start. It's when you repent and then after that, God doesn't want to hear about it anymore. But as long as there's no repentance, sooner or later, the um, truth will fall upon you. Verse 35. And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. And naturally, he's punished them. Chapter 33, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart, and go up hence, you climb that mountain again, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, unto thy seed will I give it. And here he's saying, I'm going I'm to let you go on to the, I'm going to let you lead them on to the promised land. Verse 2, and I will send an angel before thee. And I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Havite, uh, and the Jebusite. Now, what does that mean? It means when they enter the promised land, the enemy is going to be done in. It's all taken care of. 
But do you understand what's going to happen? They're going to get, they're going to send some spies out and they're going to come back shaking in their boots. They didn't believe God. And that's why there'll be a lot of years spent out in this wilderness. Okay. Well, how are you doing? Now this, 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 the lesson in this is when God tells you, your enemies will be my enemies. Your adversaries will be my adversaries. I will always protect you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. What are you afraid of? Why, why are you such a worry, worry, worry person? When God has promised you, just as he promised these, you don't have anything to worry about. I'm going to clear the path for you. There's not going to be any giants out there any longer. Verse 3. Unto a land flowing with milk and honey. For I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. Stiff-necked is like an animal that is so stubborn, you want it to turn this way or that way. You want to lead it this way or that. No way. I'm stubborn. I got my head straight forward. I'm going to do it my way if I die. And that's the kind of animal usually you want to take back to the sale barn. You don't need one like that around. Well, that's kind of the way God feels about human beings. If they're just a little too stiff-necked, they're not pliable clay that he can work with. So, verse 4, And when the people heard these evil tidings, that what could happen, they murmured, they mourned, rather, and no man did put on him his ornaments. They quit partying. They took the party clothes off right now. Verse 5, For the Lord had said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, Ye are a stiff-necked people. I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. Therefore, now put off thy ornaments in from thee, that I may know what to do unto thee. In other words, you take those party clothes off, you get rid of that calf, you, 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 you straighten your act up, and then I will decide which way to, and what to do with you. And you know something? That's still the way it is today. It's according to how you react to the Father. He created you for his pleasure. And if you give him pleasure, you do that by telling him you love him. But you give him heartache. He's not going to put up with it forever. Why? Because he doesn't have time to do heartache. That, that's for Satan and his crew. So don't be stiff-necked around the Father. Listen to him. Love him. Give him pleasure and receive the blessings of the living God. Next verse, please. Verse uh, 6. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the, by the Mount Horeb, that's to say there in the desert. 7. And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, not in it certainly, afar off from the camp and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that every one which sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. They're watching. This is what God told Moses to build. It's portable. It's the tabernacle that they could carry with them. It was movable. And he certainly built it outside of the mess that had been going on there. Verse 8, And it came to pass, when Moses went out unto the tabernacle, that all the people rose up, they're looking, and stood every man at his tent door, and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. Now you know the tabernacle that I showed you in the drawing. There the burnt offering and then the labor where you cleanse yourself. And then Moses would walk on in and there would be the candlestick. That's to say the seven lights, which are symbolic of 7,000 of God's elect. The light of Christ, for he is that light. And on the other side, on a table, is the shoe bread. 
And the shoe bread in the Hebrew tongue is is the bread of face, which means the very face of God and the bread of life that Christ bore for us in his sacrifice on the cross, the bread that received the stripes, and we get the healing. And then he would go into the altar. Moses would continue the altar of incense, where the incense goes up and so do your prayers. They go up to the Father and then entered into the Holy of Holies to commune with the living God. That's what he's going to do. Verse 9, And it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord talked with Moses. That's what the tabernacle is for. It was symbolic of what we have today to commune with God. Do you ever talk to him? He loves to hear from you when you love him and when you're serving him. But that's what these things were necessary. Just as Christ is our way today. To just go right, you don't need a preacher, you don't need the high priest, you don't need anyone other than yourself to go in and talk to your father. Commune with him. Verse 10, and all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door. And all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. About time. Verse 11, and the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. You can see why Joshua would be, would be sent to Jericho by Moses. Because he was always there with him. He never let him down. Joshua being interpreted as Jesus in English, or Yeshua in the Hebrew tongue, which is the name of Christ himself, and this young lad being symbolic, if you would. Verse 12, And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me, yet Thou hast said, I know thee thy name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. That's what you said. You know, when a leader comes point blank, where do I lead? What do I tell them? That's what you commune with God about, 13. Now, therefore, I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. I want them to be your people, Father. That's the mark of a true leader. That pleases our Father. When you pray for the people instead of yourself, it pleases God. And he's going to take care of you. Do you want me to say that again? When you pray for the people, it pleases God. Because it's not a selfish prayer. It's not just thinking about self, me, me. It's thinking about the children of God. And God really loves that because God does love his children. He certainly doesn't love what they do when they act as these had acted. Verse 14, and he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. You're going to have peace of mind. If the presence, well, what is that? It's the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit leads you, if the Holy Spirit goes with this is a promise of God, then what have you got to worry about? When you follow the Word, the written Word, as well as the leading of the Holy Spirit, what have you got to fear? Because you and Almighty God make a majority And we continue then with the next verse, verse 15. And he said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. If you're not going to go with me, don't. 16. But wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people 
have found grace in thy sight. How can we tell? Is it not in that thou goest with us? Question. So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth? So that's what's going to happen. Verse 17, And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken. For thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. He should, he had used him to free the children of Israel. Moses' name being, meaning being translated drawn from the water. And he was drawn from the water by Pharaoh's household. And, and so it was that uh, he was raised in that way to know the way of the Egyptian people. And then yet driven away and yet sent back by God to lead a people, to lead a nation, being that type of savior that truly the savior of all saviors, saviors was, and being in our Lord Jesus Christ. God promises he will always be with his people that love him. That says a lot. Don't read over it. Don't listen past it. God is always with those that love him, that follow his word. Next verse, verse 18. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. I mean, kind of, I, I, I want to see it. Well, of course, God's in a different dimension than we are. That makes it, and his glory is what? It's the Shekinah glory, meaning God is there. 19, and he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. Well, how do you know which ones it is he's going to show mercy and how do you know which ones he's going to show grace? Those that deserve it. Well, how can you be so sure? Because God is always fair, equitable. And he, it, you always get what you got coming to you from God. Some of you may be getting a lot of hack and trouble and that's what you got coming. Why? Well, you deserve it. I do. Think about it, okay? Now, it is true that God's election, God didn't promise us a rose garden, and you're never going to hear us whimper. When the hardship comes along, we know Satan is in this world. His spirit is. He's not. He's still being helped by Michael. But we know we can cut it. Well, how do we know we can cut it? Because God is with us. He is gracious to us. And and um, he shows mercy to us. When you've got that at working on your side and you complain about a little hardship, then you've got a problem. You can cut it. You can handle it. Verse 20, And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. Why? As it is written in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50, verse 50, flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Why? It's a different dimension. It's just that simple. A spirit body is a spirit body, and a flesh body is a flesh body. They are two separate dimensions, meaning quite simply, the flesh man must die and the spirit body depart before it comes into the dimension in which God is. Then you can see him. And I would say many have seen Christ in the beginning of, of, um, of, of the ministry of Christ. Why? Because as it is written in St. John chapter 14, Christ said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Why? Because he was the Father with us. Emmanuel, God with us. Um, <clears throat> but you cannot see God face to face. Uh, the angel of the Lord, true enough, you can. The Lord himself, no way. Verse 21, And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. Oh, he always puts that rock there, solid ground. Christ is that rock symbolically. If you want to see God, stand on the rock. You've, and if you've seen Christ, our rock, 
You've seen God. Verse 22. <clears throat> then it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cleft of a rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. In other words, I'm, I'm going to protect you, Moses. I'm not going to, in other words, he would have, you'd have to die to see him in that dimension. I, I want you to know that when the smoke and the fire, and God is that consuming fire, even a spiritual body as it walks through a, the smoke would make an appearance in, within the smoke. Not necessarily the appearance of a man because even the spirit body would leave a track, okay? Verse 23. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. You will not see it. No man can see it and live. And naturally, as I stated, how, how would he see? Well, after he passed, he could see the parting of the smoke and the Shekinah glory and the brightness of God. And God allowed that. That's, that's saying a lot. Moses deserved it. <clears throat> Moses had spent 40 days and 40 nights on that mountain. Six, his first six days, nothing. He was just on the mount waiting. On the seventh day, God spoke to him. He had patience. You have to learn to have patience with God. Again, why? Well, as we covered in the scripture, two or three lessons ago. God doesn't work a lot all at one time. It's little by little by little. How patient can you be and how sharp can you be to understand and to see God in action for God's promise that he will go before us, that he is with us, that he will care for us, stands even to this day. That's why it's written, when they deliver you up before the synagogue of Satan, you don't have to premeditate what you'll say. He's in charge. He takes care of his own. Why? He loves us. So stay in his word. We'll pick this up in the next lecture. We're entering the promised land, meaning it's talking about the end of this age, these examples giving us those clues. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. Spirit moves. you got a question, share it. Please never ask a question about a particular reverend or denomination or organization. We do not judge people. We have one judge. It's our Father. Hey, he keeps a tight rein. He knows exactly what goes on. Did you notice that he knew what the children were doing back in the camp a long time before Moses did? You see, he's alert, and he knows. He can even read your mind. So when you're praying, you don't even have to pray outside. So uh, let him know that you love him. We don't judge. We leave that to him. You do have the right to discern who you should listen to and who you should not. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Always a pleasure. <clears throat> now, you got a prayer request. You don't need the number. You don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. All you have to do is commune with him. 
That's what the tabernacle was symbolic of, what is necessary. Let him know you love him. He does love you indeed. He may not love all the things you do, but he does love you. Return that love and find his blessings. Father, around the globe we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, in question time, I, I want to make one statement. Uh, I said that um, in people that listen in foreign nations, that China is number three that hear Shepherd's Chapel. I did not say that China had more Christians listening to Shepherd's Chapel than any other religion. You don't hear well if that's what you heard. We only have a certain amount. It's that they, we have more people from that nation. And as I stated, there's a lot more people in that nation than a lot of nations. But thank God for every last one of them that studies with the chapel. We appreciate them. Don from Virginia, we're going to go with. Please explain Luke 17, 33 through 37. Thank you. It is the old saying that there's going to be two in the bed or the mill grinding. One's going to be taken and the other left. What is the subject? The Antichrist is coming first. The first one taken is not the one you want to be. The first one taken is taken right in the sack of Antichrist. You're no longer a spiritual virgin awaiting a virgin wedding with the Lord Jesus Christ. You have been had. You have been deceived. And how many times have you heard some preacher say, Oh, I want to be the first taken. And uh, the height of ignorance, because you know you, you have a better probably a side view of this in Mark 13 and Matthew 24, where he tells you, "Don't go." If they tell you he's in the field or they tell you somewhere else, don't go. For the Antichrist shall come first. Christ was doing his best to get that point across, but unfortunately, they still want to go jump in the bed with Satan. Have a good trip. Eddie from Mississippi, and this being a lady, why, is, why in Exodus did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Because God loves the Egyptian children also. You will read, what was it? It was in chapter 7, verse 5 of Exodus. What did it say? It said, Pharaoh's heart was hardened so the children of Israel would know that God is God. That's, that's why, because God loves those children. And therefore, he hardened Pharaoh's heart until they would finally realize, not some fish god, not, not some uh, frog, not something else, being a god here or a god there, but the living God was our savior and creator, and that they would love him. They came to that conclusion, a lot of them. Um, and this would be La Sarita from South Carolina. Uh, what does it mean where the Bible says we will meet Jesus in the air? Well, it, it, what, what is that word air? And we're, you're probably quoting from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, along about verse 17 and 18. What is that word air? It's not, it's not atmosphere. It's not sky. It is the body, it is the breath of life, air. It is the very air you breathe, meaning in your spiritual body we will meet him. Why? Because as it is written in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, instantly in the wink of an eye, we are changed into a spiritual body, and so it is. Rocky from Missouri why does Pastor Murray say that Satan is still in heaven when in Revelation it says that the mighty dragon was cast down to earth? Woe to the people. I'm just curious to know. That's all. Thank you. What Can you count? When? Let me ask you a question. When does Satan, when will he be cast from heaven? Not until the last two woe trumps. You got that? Not until the last two woe trumps. They have not happened yet. So if they have not happened yet, 
then where is he? Well, Michael hadn't tossed him out. His evil spirit can come to the earth, but he cannot until Michael and his archangels cast him out at the last two woe trumps. That would be the sixth and the seventh. Uh, ben from Oregon. I am what some call a loner. I love people and I do not resent anybody. However, I feel a deep need for privacy and I prefer to live alone, so I don't have many friends. Is this kind of lifestyle a failure in the eyes of the Lord? What does the Bible teach about it? Ben from Oregon. Ben, it's your choice. God has a purpose and a destiny for just about everybody. And there's probably a reason. And don't worry, your destiny is to witness against the false Messiah, most likely. And um, you only need one friend to accomplish that. And that's the Holy Spirit. That is Jesus Christ himself. And allowing him to speak through you as, as it is written. So um, there's, there, there are many people that are almost recluses. And, and as well, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it uh, usually means that God has set you aside to, to get the finer points of certain teachings or something else. Uh, um, I myself, being a teacher of God's Word, I am not around people except when I'm teaching or preaching. Otherwise, I'm by myself. I am, I am secluded. And I prefer it that way. Why? Because what you do for one, you must do for everyone. And if you are really researching God's word in the languages, you've got a full-time job. And, and uh, a teacher is not necessarily somebody that is an entertainer. That is to say, other than in teaching. A good teacher, his teaching is entertaining. But it's not to party. Okay. So there's nothing wrong with being alone. It gives you an opportunity to be precise in many things. So don't, don't feel bad about it and don't worry. God has a purpose. Open yourself to him and let him lead. Okay, we got, uh, I'm Vicki from Kentucky. Thank you for your program. You're welcome. I would like to know the meaning of Revelation chapter 2 verse 10 where it talks about the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried. Can you be tried this way today? Uh, it, or is this in the tribulation? It's in the tribulation when people are delivered up before the false messiah. What we've been talking about, and from you'll get a better picture from Mark 13. What are those trials about? It's so that you, with the Holy Spirit speaking through you, that that truth will go out to the whole world. Not you talking, but the Holy Spirit. Uh, you're not to premeditate what you say beforehand. Uh, that's God's election. And so it is. Uh, it is written. Make a study of Mark 13, chapter, verse by verse, and you will have a real clear understanding of that. The beauty of Revelation chapter 2 and you left that part out, is he guarantees we will not have over 10 days of that in an individual sense. As a nation, more so. We'll have more. But no individual will have to worry about it more than 10 days. Um, and, uh, okay, uh, Bill from Nevada, would you, be, would you do me a favor and tell me where it says God was married, please, and divorced, and her name? Well, it's, it's, you, would, you would look at Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8, and her name was the house of Israel. She was whoring after other gods, and God was married to her. And God wrote her a bill of divorcement, as it is written. In other words, God's a divorcee. Jeremiah 3, verse 8 documents it. But then when Christ died on the cross, he was free to remarry. She was and he was. Pastor Murray, Jane from Georgia, will God's word still be taught during the millennium or will it be a different subject? Thank you. 
it is written more than one place that in the millennium you won't have to ask somebody if they know the word of God. They will. Why? We're in spiritual bodies where you have 100% recall. You know, in, in a flesh body, uh, we do not have the recall necessarily unless God gifts, gifts you with a special recall that you do in a spiritual body. In a spiritual body, you have, you, you have no, um, uh, nothing to inhibit you, and you have 100% recall. You won't have to ask a neighbor if they know the word of God, they will. But what will be taught then? Discipline. Discipline to know how to obey God without getting sidetracked, without being deceived. Uh, there will still be deceivers. Satan is locked in a, the abyss for the thousand for the Lord's day. That's a thousand years. He is totally locked away from the world, where we have a lot better chance to reach people, because his evilness is totally bound. But do you know something? In a thousand year period, some people get bored. They don't need Satan to do bad. They are bad. So therefore, this is God's way of the final test. They're in, you see, if he chose his elect before the foundations of the world, he chose them in spiritual bodies. I'm going a little deep here, hang with me. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, I chose you before the foundations of this earth, speaking to God's election. That means they were in spiritual bodies. They did not have the hang-ups or the weaknesses we have in flesh. Therefore, in the millennium, when everyone is in a spiritual body, they should have that opportunity to either repent and be forgiven or to die. That's, that's why, because God is always fair and God is always equitable. I know that upsets some people because they want to see those sinners suffer. I mean, put them in the pit, I want to see them fry. Well, I, I don't call that heaven. I don't get any pleasure out of seeing someone fry. I do think God will blot them out in the lake of fire. They're not going to suffer. They're gone. They're blotted out. You, you heard it today, blot me out. That means just do totally do away with me. I didn't exist. And so it is. Okay, I hope that, I hope that helps you. Uh, Mar Mario from California. Pastor Murray, I came across your Bible study on November the 9th, 2010, when I was high on drugs. My friend was drunk on alcohol. Two months later, and, and also uh, bumped into your Bible study and we have stopped our wrongdoing, and we watch your Bible study all the time. Thank you for the blessing. Thank you for making Bible study simple. Please read this in, on the air that way other drug addicts and drunks will know they can be saved through Jesus. Thank you. Well, thank you, and God bless you. I appreciate that. Uh, God is good, and God can strengthen uh, James from Oklahoma. Dr. Murray, do you think the pyramids were from the first earth age? In part, yes, they were. Uh, we do not have and did not have the technology to design what is there with this, as far as semen is concerned and many other things and making the cuts that were made. Um, uh, Panoply, pan okay, we got um, Panoplia. I'm, I'm, I'm twisting that up. Penelope, I'll say it here. Um, Mark 13, 14, thinks about fleeing to the mountain, talks about fleeing to the mountains or in the house. Go, I am disabled. I use a walker and I don't know which way to go. No mountains are near. My brain is somewhat damaged and I am sorry that the way I write. I know this is a silly thing to wonder could you help me? I am ready and watching every day. Well, you, you don't have to worry about it, dear brother, and I see that you have had a, a, a stroke. That, you're, you're doing good. You don't have to worry about going to the mountains. It simply means know when you see that that it's almost time to be delivered. If you are, 
You don't have to do the talking or the writing. Christ will do it for you. So you just hang tough. You're doing good. Uh, Lily from Texas. I don't need riches or fame, and God bless you with the ability to work even after I retired from the Navy. I thank him for the roof over my head, the food on my table, and the clothes on my back. What I'm asking is for the healing of my body and mind. So I have read some passages in the Bible that state that he did give us um, the spirit of fear, but of, he didn't give us spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. I repeat this day, uh, every day, along with some other Bible verses. Is it okay to repeat these verses on a daily basis? Of course it is. Don't, don't worry. Just, you know, the, what, why um, repetition, uh, the word it is confused. God said don't chant. He, he doesn't like people to chant because then the body gets into it. Just talk to him. That's what he wants, okay? Judy from Florida, and bless you on your service. Judy from Florida. 1 Corinthians 15, 29, would you please explain? 1 Corinthians 15, 29 is one of the most misunderstood chap verses in the Bible. The whole subject of the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians is, do you as a Christian believe Christ rose from the dead? That is what the subject is. And naturally, if you believe Christ rose from the dead, you are a Christian. And if you do not believe he rose from the dead, why would you want to be a Christian? So what it continues on in that 29th verse then and says, uh, being properly interpreted, if you don't think Christ rose from the dead, why would you want to be baptized in a dead man's name? Okay, For the dead, that is to say. You know, many people twist this and translate it that you can be baptized for the dead. That's, that's not the subject. It's, it's, it's not the, it has no article. It simply means if you believe Christ uh, re did not resurrect, why would you want to be baptized in his name? That's all it means. Uh, Janice from Illinois. When Satan is here on earth and if most of the people run to him, and take communion to him, will God's people stop taking it? Or do we take it to the Father in secret? You don't have to be in secret. You can take it. I watch you every day, and I want to thank you for teaching the truth of God's holy word. I love the Father very much, and I thank him for bringing you into our home. Well, well it's the word that he brings into our homes, and I just thank him so much for that. Uh, Janice, don't ever let anyone stop you from taking communion. Uh, you, we always have that with us, uh, but the thing is, is um, uh, be ready when that time comes because our witness will soon be upon us at that time. Ricky from Louisiana, my question is, where can I find in the scriptures the four angels bound at the bottom of the Euphrates River? And I'll bet you've been listening to my lecture on Kings of the East very recently because that's where it's really brought out. Revelation chapter 9, verse 14. Revelation chapter 9, verse 14. And the thing you want to remember about those angels, they're bound. Let me ask you a question. Which angels are bound? God's holy angels are not bound. But there is one group of angels that are bound, and that's the fallen angels. Okay, Four of the top brass. Uh, Pastor Murray, did Esau ever realize that he was hated by God? Does this word hated also mean love less or actually hated to God? No, it, it means God hated him. Um, I, I know that in one place it says you must love your family less than you do the living God. That, that's a proper translation taught in the book of Luke. But... As it is written in the book of Romans and as it is written in Malachi chapter 1, God hated Esau. Why? Esau didn't care anything about God. I mean, he would sell his birthright for a bowl of mush. Just bam, just like that. He had no respect whatsoever for Almighty God. 
and that happened in the first earth age and this is why God could plainly say while he was Jacob I loved Esau I hated while they were still in their mother's womb well naturally in the flesh bodies they hadn't turned a tap yet that's an old saying that means they hadn't done anything good or bad they were in the womb but it's what the souls did that God placed in that womb in the first earth age Esau was no good okay he just if you don't care anything about your heritage it means you don't care anything about your father and therefore your father is not going to care anything about you it's that period uh, Martha from Kentucky okay where is my in order to pray do we have to yell or scream for him to hear us I attend I, I don't want to go into which church you might attend you don't even have to say it out loud for God to hear you okay? God knows what you're thinking so you don't uh, um, God is not hard of hearing and just as when you know when Christ God with us fed the multitude he didn't feed them as a mob he made them sit down in groups of 50 in order God loves order and discipline so um, God knows he's a heart knower he knows what you're thinking and I'm I'm thinking I'm out of time I better close down here saying that I love you because you enjoy studying God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse but most of all God loves you for it makes his day you make his day boy is he gonna make yours we're brought to you by your tithes and offering if we have helped you you help us keep coming to you once you do that you bless God he will always bless you most important though you listen to me listen good you stay in his word every day in his word is a good day even with trouble you know why because Jesus Yeshua is the living word hearing God's word with understanding will change your life we hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800 643 4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you. Ezra and Nehemiah. These two books are necessary to understand the returning to the Father in that sense of the example set forth in the end times of the rebuilding of God's most favorite place on earth. Also, within these two books, you find the hidden secret, hidden from most people's eyes, that the study in the Hebrew and the Chaldee that is given in these particular books will teach you how that the priesthood itself became polluted during this period of time. This is to say about 400 years before Christ walked the earth to the time that he did walk. Instructing you very wisely, setting the example of how it is that we gather back to Christ himself. Ezra and Nehemiah, fantastic. You'll enjoy them.
From Gravit, Arkansas, this is Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. Join with us now as Pastor Murray takes you on a book by book, chapter by chapter, line by line, study in God's Word. Now, here's Pastor Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Hey, you know what? We're going to finish that part of why did Christ speak in parables. We know he did, and if, to some I'm sure it would seem unfair. Why would Jesus say, it's not meant for them to understand? But then take a look at the, our people, God's children, as they've come down through the years, stubborn, stiff-necked, won't listen, 